flow class. We're going to continue in chapter 26. This is part two now, and we're going to be looking at uh, what does it take, all right, to uh, become a holder in due course. Uh, this uh, is not the slide I want to be on to start with. Let me back up. All right. So um, I want you to focus in this um, part of Chapter 26 on uh, this new concept, this new idea, the holder in due course. All right. Now, whenever you transfer a negotiable instrument to a third party, that third party is going to be called a holder. Whether or not that holder is a holder in due course depends on the context of the transfer. All right, so what is the big deal here? First of all, you need to understand that an ordinary holder is a transferee, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, uh, the, the, the main difference though between a holder and a holder in due course is uh, what defenses or what defenses can be raised against the payment to that third party holder. All right? If the third party is an ordinary holder, then there are more defenses that the person can raise or the, um, um, the uh, yeah, can, that can be raised to stop the payment or to say that they will not pay. And so it needs to be litigated and determined whether one of those defenses uh, should uh, excuse a person from having to pay on the instrument. If the third party recipient, the transferee can be a holder in due course though under the UCC, all right, they will have, um, they will be more likely to collect because there are fewer defenses available to the person who owes the money, to the obligated party. And this is why if you are the transferee of a negotiable instrument, you want to be a holder in due course. You're more likely to get paid uh, with less trouble than if you're an ordinary holder. All right, now, the way we refer to uh, the uh, number of defenses uh, that can be raised, an ordinary holder faces both universal and personal defenses. So it's a longer list of defenses whereas a holder in due course has a more limited list of defenses we refer to as only the universal defenses. Now, we will not learn all the detail of these defenses until the next chapter, but keep this in mind as we go through and learn about how does a transferee become a holder in due course. All right, so let me go into that. There are three requirements in order to uh, be able to say you are a holder in due course under the Uniform Commercial Code. All right, I'm going to go through these three three requirements first, and then I have a um, some uh, a, a diagram of sorts, kind of a photographic diagram from your textbook, which is very useful in understanding and ex and explaining this concept. All right, so let's go through the three requirements first. The three requirements are as follows. First of all, um, a holder in due course must take for value. All right. What does this mean, value? Well, value under the UCC is not exactly the same as it is under contract law. All right, so you have to just get your mind around this. There are five different ways that the UCC will allow uh, to uh, be looked at and to count as value, and they are as follows, all right? Uh, one, if the uh, transferee should perform the promise at the time of the transfer, meaning complete what they say they're going to pay, so they make the payment. That's why many times, most of the time when we are discussing this concept, I'll just say, or the examples would just say that the third party transferee pays uh, the transferor for the instrument, all right? They just give them cash. That would fulfill the first requirement there, or the um, um, first example of value, all right? All right, another way to find value would be for the transferee to give the um, holder, the original um, holder of the instrument, a security interest in the instrument, all right? 
So not pay cash right away, but say to the transferor, well, look, I will give you an interest in the instrument. I'll recognize that. And that counts for value under the UCC. Right. The third method of paying value would be uh, in exchange for the instrument to um, reduce or wipe out an antecedent debt, meaning a prior amount owed. All right, so in return or in exchange for the transfer of the instrument, the transferee says, okay, you owed me uh, so much money from previously, I will write that down or I will wipe it out in return for this transfer of the instrument. Okay. All right, number four, uh, if the transferee gives another negotiable instrument in exchange for the instrument that's being transferred, and number five, this is similar to number four, if the transferee gives an irrevocable commitment as payment, uh, for instance, an irrevocable letter of credit, all right, a type of negotiable instrument as well, all right. The last two we don't usually see too much in the examples that we try to track uh, when we're learning this, but uh, they are part of the statute under the UCC, all right. Now, the one thing that is not accepted as value is an executory promise. So no, just bare promise that in return for the transfer of the promissory note, uh, the transferee can't say, I will pay you sometime in the future, uh, you know, 90% of the val face value of that instrument, all right? This will not work, all right? Um, whereas you can have uh, some executory promise under contract law, you can't have it here under the UCC. It just won't count for this purpose. All right, so that's value. We'll take a look at that um, uh, again when I put up the uh, scenario from your textbook um, and, and walk through this uh, in full with you. All right, let's look at the second element. The second element to um, creating a holder in due course is this element to take in good faith. And here we're looking at the transferee, the person that will become the holder, a third party holder. Uh, who wants to be a holder in due course. All right, so what you do is you look at the circumstances of the transfer. And this is done on a very case-by-case -case basis. And what we're looking for is just a level of honesty. We're looking for the transferee to have clean hands, not to know anything about what has gone on, perhaps with the instrument or the underlying transaction that the instrument is documenting. All right, and to not know that there's any problem with the under with the instrument or the transaction that is documenting. All right, and if the transferee can say pretty much that uh, they they are have no knowledge of anything underhanded or anything dishonest, then they will uh, meet the criteria here and be well on their way to becoming a holder in due course. All right, what I want you to pay attention to here is that when we look at problems. All right, we only have so much that we can tell you in a written problem, right? So when you see uh, some hints such as, oh, the, tra the transfer was done in a dark alley or it was done uh, in a place that's not normally used for, you know, uh, business, like in a, a, a bar or in a, um, a pool hall or so something like that, what they're trying to tell you, all right, and if you don't already get my drift here, is that, this is a transaction not done in good faith, all right? Uh, if you see that the um, amount that the transferee is paying, okay, uh, for the transfer of the instrument is like at a real discounted amount, that also is an indication to you that there could be a situation where there's a lack of good faith, all right? So just so you know some things to look out for. All right, we're going to take a look at this case. This is case uh, 26.3. It's called George versus Metro Fixtures. And it's just an illustration for you of a real case, not too old a case, where uh, the courts found that uh, there was sufficient good faith um, and there should be no problem in finding that the, um, the person that has the instrument is, is definitely a, a holder in due course and can collect. All right, so here, what happened is that we have um, uh, the plaintiff, um, a, a company I, uh, I think is called uh, Clinton, uh, well, no, let's see. Uh, uh, no, the company is called Freestyle, owned by a Mr. Clinton George, all right? And he had a former employee, uh, Cassandra DeMary, who embezzled funds 
when uh, that was learned that she had embezzled, uh, I imagine she was fired right away and they gave her an opportunity to repay uh, the funds, all right? The amount of funds was, uh, I believe, over $200,000, all right? Um, and she had also not really handled the business of the company well, all right? So what did she do to try to make up for this amount of money she had embezzled? She went to work for her own family's company, all right? Um, and she, um, she wrote a check from her family's company for $189,000. She gave that to uh, Clinton George and Freestyle. And um, basically, uh, the, she didn't give it to them directly. She deposited it straight into uh, George's bank account, George and Freestyle's a bank, bank account, all right? It came kind of to light later after a couple of years. Her family got wind of that and they sued Clinton George and Freestyle Company to try to get that money back, saying that their daughter ha did not have authority to write that check. All right. And so the issue became, can the plaintiff here be a holder in due course, uh, even if they never had physical possession of the instrument? Uh, and another kind of a takeoff on that was, can the plaintiff have taken it in good faith if they never had this physical possession? All right. So it went uh, through um, uh, one level of appeal and then it went ultimately up to the highest uh, Supreme Court in the state of Colorado. All right. I just took note of that. And the um, Supreme Court of Colorado said, well, we find that all the requirements for holder in due course have been met here, including the possession, uh, taking possession, uh, even if in a constructive manner, not physical possession, direct physical possession, but um, it's good enough. It was deposited into the account. There's delivery there. So they said that's constructive um, delivery and there's a good faith. There's nothing dishonest about uh, the uh, uh, instrument being given in this way. And so since the court finds that there's constructive delivery and possession, that it's been done in good faith, um, the court concluded that George, Mr. George and the Freestyle Company, they are holders in due course and can collect. They do not have to repay it to the uh, former employee's family. All right, that's the second element taken in uh, good faith. The third element is that the instrument needs to be transferred or taken without notice of any problem or defect. That means that the transferee cannot know that the instrument is overdue or has been dishonored by the uh, either the maker or by the uh, drawer, all right? So if the transferee has any knowledge of some problem, they're not gonna qualify as a holder in due course, all right? Now, what happens if the instrument was incomplete originally, but then was completed? Let's say maybe the payee's name had not been put in, but then completed later, or maybe the dollar amount on a check had not been put in, but then put in later, all right? Um, if the transferee can't know that, then they're going to take without notice of that issue or problem. All right. So um, just kind of keep that in mind because there'll be some problems we'll be looking at uh, that 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 particular idea comes up. All right. Um, continuing to talk about um, the last bit here, um, special situations uh, regarding the holder in due course. All right. So one. Um, a topic that comes up here is the shelter principle. And what this is, is that if you take from a holder in due course, if you're a subsequent holder uh, after a holder in due course, generally speaking, you will also be a holder in due, due course. You do not have to separately qualify. All right. So it's as if once there is a holder in due course, every subsequent holder can be a holder in due course. There's only one exception. Um, that exception is that uh, if someone originally could not qualify as a holder in due course and uh, they have reason to know that they can't qualify they cannot set it up so that someone else takes the instrument to become a holder in due course and then uh, try to take from that uh, alternative holder therefore kind of laundering or cleaning up the uh, succession of ownership there all right we will not allow someone to abuse the shelter principle in that fashion. So shelter principle, special situation. Um, a couple of other situations just to bring uh, bring up and, and tell you about. All right, 
Value is given in each of these three scenarios that are listed here, but no holder in due course status will be acquired. All right, what are those three situations? Well, if an instrument is purchased at a judicial sale, meaning offered uh, through the courts, perhaps through a foreclosure, right? no holder in due course status acqu is acquired. All right, if um, the instrument is acquired at, as a part of a decedent's estate, again, no holder in due course status acquired. And then if it's purchased as part of a bulk transfer, meaning a company might be going out of business and they sell off their assets and part of what they're selling uh, is an instrument and someone buys it at that bulk transfer sale, again, no holder in due course uh, status um, is acquired. All right. Now, I said I wanted to go back and look at this example just to illustrate a holder in due course to you. So let me um, put that up here on the screen and see if I can do that fairly quickly. Um, all right, I have it set up. I opened up your textbook. All right, here is um, the example I like to use in your textbook. All right, let me raise it up here. All right, now, it is in your book, and what they're illustrating here in your book is um, perhaps... Uh, kind of the opposite of how I use the diagram. What they're trying to show you here, the way it's um, been, um, uh, the, the, the example, the language they give you here, and the um, markings on this diagram that they give you here is to show you that this is not a holder in due course, that the third party here will not become a holder in due course. All right. However, we can use the same diagram, and I can change the facts a little to show you how we create a holder in due course. Okay. All right, so the scenario, how it works is that Shana Morrison, she buys a car from Heritage Motors in the middle there, okay? She buys a BMW, very expensive car, so she cannot pay for it all in cash. Instead, she signs a note. She signs a $50,000 note and gives it to Heritage Motors. Heritage Motors gives her the car, and you'll notice that uh, uh, below that second arrow, it says defective goods. The car turns out being a lemon of some sort, all right? It's not functioning properly, and Shauna is not happy about it, all right? However, by the time she discovers that the car is not working correctly, what has Heritage Motors done? It has taken her instrument, her note, and they have transferred it on to the third party, Apollo Financial Services, and that's where you see the arrows across uh, the, the upper arrows, You'll see how the note goes from Shauna to Heritage Motors and then on to more um, to Apollo, sorry, to Apollo. All right. That's what we mean by the transfer, going to a third party who doesn't know anything about the transaction between Shauna and Heritage Motors. All right. Now, what does Apollo give to Heritage Motors for that instrument, though, for Shauna's signed promissory note? In the diagram, it says a promise to pay in six months that would not qualify Apollo to be a holder in due course because it's an executory promise. It just will not count, all right? However, we can change that, you know, because, uh, you know, I'm using this for example with you. So let's say Apollo gives Heritage Motors $40,000 for the $50,000 note, all right? If that's what Apollo does, gives $40,000 for Shauna's note, that would then uh, qualify Apollo to be a holder in due course. All right, think about that. Three requirements to be a holder in due course. Got to take for value, which Apollo has by paying out $40,000. Take in good faith. Doesn't know anything about the problem with the BMW. So taking in good faith, nothing dishonest here. All right, and lastly, take without notice. Again, that kind of overlaps with the good faith. Apollo does have, has no notice that there's any underlying problem with the transaction. Apollo can be a bona fide holder in due course, and that means Shauna, when she is unhappy with her car and says to Heritage, I am not paying any more on the note that I owe you. All right, I got this bad car, and uh, I want you know to fix this transaction. You take it back and give me my money back, something like that. All right, um, Heritage has to deal with that, but Apollo does not. Apollo, as a holder in due course, will not be subject, okay, subject to the defense that Shauna wants to raise. Her defense is a lack of consideration. Her, she didn't get the benefit of her bargain, and she will have to pay Apollo 
despite the fact that she has a bad car. All right. And so this is what this is a really should illustrate for you uh, what they're trying to accomplish uh, with this concept of holder in due course under the UCC. All right. Um, as I said in the last chapter, it keeps money kind of moving in the economy. Apollo can still collect and not have to deal with any of the issues that Shauna is raising. Uh, and rightfully, you know, Heritage has got to honor whatever promises they have made to Shauna. It's really not Apollo's problem. All right. So anyway, I hope that that helps you to understand a lot more fully uh, what is key about this principle of holder in due course. All right. We're going to look at several problems uh, at the back of the chapter. I'm going to make another video uh, with those. And of course, I will make a video uh, with uh, with a mind tap, uh, or an appropriate mind tap problem. Or, uh, all right. So I will see you in um, the next video. All right.